test. So um, generally what I say is this is a two or three year process um, and by the second or third year you should have 90-95% of your deficiencies addressed. There's going to be a couple like manganese and boron probably that will take a little bit longer. Um, but in general, the vast majority of your deficiencies you know, will probably be addressed in the first couple of years. And I would suggest taking a soil test every year for the first couple of years. Once you're you know, a little bit comfortable with how things are moving and how to do it, and you're more trusting your intuition, you can go two or three years without taking a soil test and be totally fine. And you were talking about waste management is causing you know, a lot of Obviously, topsoil, but then minerals along with it to be leaching out on the side of soil or leach out yeah. the soil. So, then hypothetically, after you've gone through the program for the first couple of years, if you have good management practices yeah. with little leaching and little erosion, yes, you should be able to maintain for quite a while. My idea is that um, we should, especially, it depends entirely on whether you're doing tillage or whether you're doing permaculture, polyculture, savanna ecosystem. The more perennial and polyculture your system is, the more rapidly you should not need to add anything for decades. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, basically the way I see it is the tank is empty. Once the tank is filled up, um, then you might need to top it off every year with you know 50 pounds of this or 100 pounds of that. But um, you know you're basically you're just you're topping off the tank, um, and you're just in a little bit of nuance and, and modulation and sensitivity, and you can start doing more exciting stuff like um, preparations and you know, essential oils and flower essences and, you know, Subway. frequencies and <laughs> all kinds of good stuff. But until the physical plane is basically in line, those subtle energies can't ground. And, you know, the benefit is, is not realized anywhere near what it could be. Um, I've had to struggle with this one. Like, I was all about the energy of things and um, my experience and, and, you know, thoughtful listening to others is when the physical plane is basically in line, then the energies can really get grounded and stuff can really take off. But yeah, the basic answer I would say is once once the soil is in good shape, you should not need to be adding much, if anything, um, for the rest of your lifetime. You know, for me, I think you know I'm taking off a lot of crops. I'm still engaging in limited tillage, and so I have a basic recipe for like a, a mineral fertilizer that I put down a little bit of rock phosphate, a little bit of green sand, a little bit of you know soluble mag every spring. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. Which is my basic like I'm taking this much off, I'm putting this much back um, recipe, and it's pretty much one size fits all. But um, it should be pretty nominal. Is that that's that's exactly the idea. Yeah. How much compost do you apply? I don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean it's probably about you know three or four hundred pounds per acre per year because it's an ingredient in my one size fits all mix. Um, but it's basically there as an inoculum not as an nitrogen source or a potassium source. Um, I know people that use 20 tons per acre per year, and, or 60 tons. This is a guy in California who's a really successful farmer. He uses 60 tons per acre of compost a year. I'm like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> he lives right next to a pretty decent sized city, and you know, California said it's illegal to put green waste in the trash, so you have to compost everything, so they got piles of compost hanging around. And he can get his hands on a ton of compost. But from a systemic standpoint, if we're thinking about the landscape and agriculture and the planet, you know, massive applications of compost, I think, are um, not realistic. Um, and I don't see nature applying a lot of compost. I see nature having the leaves fall and compost in place. Um, you know, the roots are growing and dying back and composting into the soil. So that's what I do on my farm is I don't add compost. I don't take things out of the field. I let things be there. You can call it sheet composting, I think, but basically that means you don't do anything. Um, and disturb things, bother things as little as possible. Um, so yeah, I don't use compost. Um, it's generally, as I was saying before, considered to be a source of these soluble nutrients like nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus. And if you've got a well-functioning system, you should not need to be adding those things. You say you don't take things out of your fields. Are you talking about like field debris? Like tomato like plants and squash plants and those pepper plants. Yeah, absolutely place. not. Do I take them out? Yes, I leave them all right there. Um, and if need be, I'll mold them up in the spring. If there's any residue that needs to be chopped up into little pieces. Sometimes there's kale stalks that are need to get mowed. Right. So I'll come through with a rotary mower and just quick pass, take them out. But no, I don't take anything out besides the crop I'm harvesting. Okay. Yeah, which brings us to the pest and disease question for some people, and rotations also for some people. So also rotations. And you're able to do that like. 
I mean, I, I envision doing that and having a hard time managing, like, you know, putting plants in because there's debris in the way and stuff. Um, what happens when you have a well-functioning gut flora in the soil is stuff disappears. Right. Um, it's right. remarkable how rapidly it disappears. Um, and a mower <clears throat> um, chops things into pretty small pieces. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I no, I don't. I, I, I think that is the residue is all very good and valuable, and I don't want to take it out of the field. I don't really feel like carrying it and turning it and carrying it back and spreading it. So like a lot of work. That's totally what about how about weeds day. that are have gone to seed? God forbid. There's a whole ton of them in my fields right now. Um, big tall pigweeds in lands quarters and. Um, I mean, I'm not bothered, like enough, I'm not bothered enough by them to pull them out. Like growing <laughs> salad greens, yeah. you know, weeds are pretty challenging for me because... So I just picked on Thursday um, 30 pounds of salad greens, 30 pounds of arugula off of one bed yeah. in one of my um, caterpillar tunnels. Um, and it had never been weeded and it took to sort 30 pounds of, of arugula, I mean, less than an hour. Mm -hmm. um, 30 pounds of arugula, I'm not sure if anybody's done salad greens. That's a, that's a, that's a bunch of arugula. Mm -hmm. It had never been weeded, and it was basically, we just were like, we dump it on the table and sort of, you know, look for bad leaves. Okay, there's one, there's a weed. Right. Um, um, almost, almost completely weed free. So you started on a table, not like in water in a tub? Uh, I pick into a tote, like a 20 gallon tote, and I dump it on the kitchen table, and put the tote on the ground and then brush the leaves off into the tote uh -huh. and then throw the bad, one, bad ones onto the ground, onto the floor. Right. And then take that tote full of greens and dump it in the sink. Yep. Um, and it uh, works pretty well. I told you we made $1,000 on Thursday? Yeah. I'm like, I'm pretty proud it? of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's November! <laughs> a thousand bucks, one day. <laughs> Is that like a hundred pounds or something? That's like at ninety pounds, yeah. Because my price goes up to eleven dollars a pound in November uh -huh. from ten. Yeah. <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, that has to do with the bacterial fungal uh, dynamics, um, which I will talk about. Should talk about bacterial fungal and tillage and compost. So I'll make that point this afternoon. Um, how do you uh, create an environment where your crops grow better than your weeds? I talked to you before about you know if the environment's appropriate, the crop, the, the plant that you want to grow should grow well, right? In certain environments, grass grows better than anything else, so grass becomes dominant. In certain environments, oaks grow better than other things else, and oaks become dominant. Um, if you are doing a good job growing carrots, the carrots will become dominant and outcompete everything else, which is a very distant concept for many people. Anybody weeded carrots before? A week late? Terrible. <laughs> How many years have I weeded carrots? A week or two late, right? I mean, you're picking through the climax forest for the saplings. It's ridiculous. It's, a, it's ridiculous. Until, what was it last year? It was, it was two years ago, the first time it happened, and the last year also. I weeded my 325 foot beds of carrots for a grand total of like half an hour the entire season. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. The carrots germinated and grew and the weeds didn't. It just was, I mean, and this is starting to happen more and more. It has to do with the underlying soil dynamics and creating an environment where the weeds don't germinate because the, you know, basically the gut flora is wrong for them. Um, fungal, fungal dominated soil is bad gut flora for pigweeds and lance quarters, so they don't germinate in that environment. It's like when you've got a hay field and it's, it's hay and hay and hay and hay and hay and hay for 50 years and you till it up and then all the pigweeds germinate. Have you ever seen that happen? Mm -hmm. Nobody brought the pigweed seeds in. The tilling up of the soil created an environment which was appropriate for the pigweeds to germinate. Yes? So if you, if you manage the dynamics properly and create an environment where they, it's not appropriate for them, they won't germinate. It's not that they're not going to be there, it's that they you know, will germinate much, much less. But isn't like a carrot or a lettuce seed also like an annual that also prefers a at least balanced fungal? Um, it prefers a balanced bacterial fungal and not a bacterially dominant. Yeah. So the way you manage the soil modulates that. I'll, I'll, for those of you who haven't been in the course, you too have 
<laughs> seen me speak before. Um, we'll go into this after lunch. But I do. I want to move forward with this mineral balancing thing. And just a quick time check because I'm totally oblivious. Twelve twenty. What's that? Twelve twenty. Twelve twenty. Okay, I thought it was getting late. Yes. All right. Um, so I think we covered the mineral balancing thing fairly well. I'd like to run through three or four um, more elements and just do them. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, we'll do one on the board, then you guys can do one yourselves, and then we can do another one. Um, it, it, I think if you do it a couple times, you'll see it's a pretty simple process. So um, let's start with boron. I'll do it on the board. You tell me what to do. So it's um, three parts per million times two to be parts per acre is six. Yep. Everybody understands what we're doing here? Nothing complicated. Six minus 1.66 equals 4.34 pounds per acre for run needed. Where'd that ideal number come from? The ideal? Yeah. Top of page two. Target levels for all nutrients are how to page two. All right. Everybody knows this, even though you're being polite in the back rows. I'm assuming the point eight three times two is from the other sheet that I. That's from the self test report, which you could go look on someone's shoulder as well. Wanted to push it. Thank you. All right. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you keep your own self test. Yes, you can give him that one. That's exactly perfect. Um, okay. So on the top of page four, I believe, are a couple of sources of boron with their percent concentrations. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what are those? Which one do you want to use? Borax. Borax. Borax? Okay, we're going to use borax. So now what do we, what do, we do? So you say that loud. You got it. 4.34 yeah. put it over the 11%. 4.34 divided by 0.11 equals 40 ish pounds. 39. 39. 39 and a half. Take it in. Call 40. 40. Yeah. 40 pounds per acre or X needed. Is that the answer? No. No, that's not the answer. And one last step, which is really important. What's that last step? The percentage of boron in the borax is that already we already got that. is eleven. You don't want to poison your soil. So, so therefore, before. you're going to look at the yearly max. Look at the max yearly application. This is how much your soil needs. That's not how much you're going to apply. How much, how much, what's the, what's the final answer? 30 pounds per acre borax. All right? Yes? Where did the 4.34 come from? 4.34 um, came from right here. Ah, uh -huh. gotcha. It came from right here. Mm -hmm. All right. Everybody followed that? Mm -hmm. Nothing too complicated about it? Let's do manganese. And you guys can do it on your own little papers. And I won't do it on your own board. So you can see how far you can go. This is manganese, which is below iron, not magnesium. Manganese. Is it always have different sheets, so that's why you do have different sheets. Can we get whatever the deficit is? For those people who don't have the um, What's the value on the report? It's 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 ppm. What are we starting with?
Those guys are all done. Those guys are so good. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I got. Well, I can't really read the board. What was the... Um, oh, we started off at 85, so we're going to 80 and 90. doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Got 170, so we either got 160 or 180 or whatever. Um, which will make this 129 or 139. Um, 18 times 2 is subtraction. We need 134 pounds per acre manganese. Manganese sulfate, MnSO4, equals 30% manganese, which is on your top of page 4. Um, so 134 divided by 0.32 equals plus or minus 400 yeah. pounds per acre manganese sulfate. Max application rate is 40 pounds per acre manganese sulfate. Does that mean we'd be applying 20 for like 20 years? Year for like 20 year, <laughs> 20 years. Um, if none of it leached out or got taken by the plants, oh. yes. Um, and if some of it leached out or got taken by the plants, then it would be more than 20 years. If manganese sulfate was going to be your sole source of manganese. Um, I like to use manganese as an example um, or an opportunity to bring up what my thoughts are about more um, holistic, systemic, local, you know, permaculture-ish sources for minerals. I don't think we necessarily need to be buying things in from quarries from long ways as away. Um, I think actually, if you look at nature and how nature did it um, with the river valleys, it was basically crushed up rock dust that was spread on the um, floodplains every year that were able to, you know, create an environment where for crops could, could flourish for um, millennia. So I do think that crushed up rock dust mixed with a little bit of seawater is all we would need anywhere on the planet to systemically revitalize the land. Um, and luckily, the planet is made up of rock and seawater. So um, interestingly, because the planet is made up of rock and seawater, it be become very difficult for anybody to corner the market on either of these sources and therefore make any money selling them. You know how this works? If something is prevalent, then the, the, the value is low. And if the value is low, then there's no marketing behind it. You know how that one works? Yeah. So for me, like the fact that these things are so naturally available in such, you know, locally available in such massive quantities is part of why you don't know about them. Because nobody can make any money on it. And uh, most of our supply chains of knowledge, or a lot of them, come from people's self-interest. So um, this road is not paved, um, but it's some sort of a crushed rock mixed with powder, yeah? Most of the roads around here when they're not pavement. Um, do you know where that comes from? The or uh, that one. Right up the street. Yeah. Quarry, less than 10 miles away. There is a small one. Yeah. yeah. And the process of quarrying, correct me if I'm wrong, is one where you basically take a little drill or a big drill drill a hole in the rock, stick some explosives in there, blow it up, take the bucket loader, pick up the crushed rock, or the chunks of rock, put them in a, in a, you know, a um, truck, drive it to your crusher, dump the rock into the crusher, it gets crushed down to whatever the particle size is appropriate for the batch. So they've got these screens that have a you know, one inch stone, and a three quarter inch stone, and a half inch stone, and a three eighths inch stone. There's these different screens that take out the different sizes of the crushed rock and they're used for different purposes. So 
blacktop pavement is, you know, three eighths inch stone plus tar. Um, and part of the process of crushing rock to make roads um, is the production of something that's called uh, crusher dust or float or fines. And you can go to any quarry around and you'll find that they make more crusher dust than they have a need for. And so they end up taking it and dumping it back into the hole. Mm. Um, so generally it's available for the price of you know, running the loader to put it into your truck or um, you know, $2 a ton, $5 a ton, maybe $10 a ton, that's pretty high. It's usually less than $10 a ton. Um, it's usually less than 5 or 10 miles from your house. So generally, if you were to get a dump truck load of crushed up rock dust, which will have between 25 and 50 different elements in it, um, something similar to what the um, Ganges dumps on the you know, floodplain every year, or the Nile dumps on the floodplain every year, um, you can, you know, it costs you more to drive it across town than it costs to buy it. And it's a naturally occurring, not naturally occurring, it is a already existing byproduct of a fairly natural industry that is totally local. Um, so anyway, for me that's a really exciting um, solution to this question of manganese because um, a, lot of the, a lot of the granites and basalts have good quotient of manganese in them. Um, green sand, if anyone's ever bought green sand, is a, is a basalt, a local basalt from New Jersey. Not local, but relatively local. That's got 2% manganese. Um, so, um, and it's not soluble. The thing about manganese sulfate is it's soluble. You don't want to put too much down at once. The thing about these rock dusts is they're not soluble. They have lots of surface area, so they're there, so the bacteria and fungi can go and digest them, but they're not soluble, so they're not going to leach. So you can address the issue much more systemically, much less expensively, much more rapidly with something like local rock dust than manganese sulfate. What about granite dust? Granite is, a, is one of the rock, rock dust. So the, the only issue with this whole thing is figuring out what's in this quarry's rock dust and what's in that quarry's rock dust because you can figure out how many pounds of what you need, but then you need to know what's in the rock dust and how, how much of that's being yeah, addressed. How would I do that? That's the problem. I mean, I get granite dust, I just put it down. Yeah, well that's one way to do it is to... <laughs> You can solve, you can, if you can talk to your land, you solve a lot of problems, right? You bring a few samples, you say, hey guys, what do you want? Right. How much of this do you want? If you know anybody who's at all psychic or, you know, intuitive, you know, be very respectful to them, ask very politely, um, offer them something, um, if they would talk to your land for you. I think it's really valuable. Uh, there is a process we're trying to go through with the organization, which is to um, take samples from quarries and run them through pretty sophisticated, you know, assays, <laughs> types of assays to identify not only what's in them, broad spectrum, but also the reactivity, availability, digestibility by the soil life. Depending on the chemical structure, some bonds are really, really strong, like double triple bonds, and the soil life is not likely to get those, take minerals from those compounds. So you can put down a rock that has certain elements in it, but if it's really hard to digest, the soil is not going to take it. So it doesn't matter only what's in the rock dust, it matters what the chemical signature is and the chemical structure. So it's a bit complicated if you want to get per perfect about it, but in general, a broad spectrum dose of rock dust um, is a pretty good thing and pretty inexpensive. And the only issue is one of logistics of shoveling tons of rock dust. Is a, you know, this would be a pain in the butt after <laughs> a while. A drop spreader, uh, like a lime drop spreader, would be the appropriate tool to be using to spread it on, on acreage. Um, because it's basically crushed up rock, same as limestone is. So anything that would apply limestone, powdered limestone, not pelletized powdered limestone, would be appropriate for spreading rock dust. Uh, generally, two to 20 tons per acre is what I tell people is a systemic dose. Um, um, it generally costs about $75 an hour to run a dump truck. A dump truck can usually legally carry 22 tons. So you can do the math. But um, $75 an hour, figure out how long it takes you to drive from there, there to the quarry and back, and then 22 tons. Um, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, you can get a lot of potential value uh, for your for your soil. The other one is seawater. Um, seawater, sea salt, is a really valuable commodity. I talked about salt in the soup. Uh, people know that in ancient times, salt in many places was more valuable than gold by weight. People took caravans carrying blocks of salt hundreds of miles through deserts because it was so valuable. Um, <clears throat> salt is valuable in certain quantities. So from my perspective, um, 
sea salt, sea water, has 90 different elements in it. It has a full spectrum of elements, a broader spectrum than any other naturally occurring material. Um, there are massive deposits of 300 million year old sea salt, you know, all over the country. You can buy it for $150 a ton, sea salt, or you can go to the ocean and harvest your own sea water. Um, but I would say generally um, about 75 pounds per acre of sea salt per year is a nice prophylactic dose. 75 pounds per acre of sea salt. I do it on all 24 of my acres, the swamp, the fields, the hillsides, the forest, on principle, because I understand the value of that broad spectrum of trace elements. <clears throat> um, it's great for pastors, anybody who's doing uh, forages, and they don't have a lot of money to improve their forage. Um, get a one ton, you know, bulk bag of sea salt, and you can cover a bunch of acres for a couple hundred bucks. Is um, that better than uh, Himalayan salt? It's less expensive. <laughs> By a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it does have to be fine? Kind of uh, it comes in all kinds of grades. Yeah. Uh, rock salt basically is a, is a commodity. Yeah. And I mean, literally 100 bucks a ton, 150 bucks a ton um, in a big bag. If you're talking 75 pounds per acre, that's um, 25, 28 acres you can cover for 150 bucks. That's a pretty good investment. That's six dollars an acre. Where do you get that one done today? Um, there are various sources around the country. Sourcing of all these minerals is a topic we should probably talk about, um, as well as timing and application. So we just end on, end on that. Um, <clears throat> do I need to do another element, or people pretty much got it? I think you're, you either got it or you don't got it at this point. <laughs> Anybody who doesn't get it, feel free to come and talk here during lunch. Um, we are doing something with the organization now, which I feel comfortable talking about. Historically, when I've given this course, I've said to figure it out yourself. Um, this is an educational workshop, and I'm not talking about sources of materials, so that there's no question that this is an educational workshop, and we're not talking about selling stuff. But um, I guess I'm getting corrupted to my old age. Um, the organization has a number of systemic objectives that we're developing and building out, and one of them is what we're calling a mineral depot, um, which basically means we're trying to go straight from the quarry to our members with no middlemen so we can drop the prices down 40%, 60%, 80% off of your retail. If you're going to buy rock phosphate or you're going to buy green sand, how much would you pay um, versus what can we get it for? So um, this for members, for members of the organization, um, we have a whole list of minerals that are available, prices, um, and local chapters to coordinate orders through. Um, we're building an infrastructure out to, to get that done. Otherwise. You know, um, I'm not sure who your closest, I'm not sure if Paul Sachs has it, North Country Organics, he's not, he's kind of far away from here though, he's in the other, the other on the west, east side of the state, far, farther north. I don't know who your suppliers are around here. There are people around that have sea salt, you can look around for it. Um, but, yeah, North access North to country materials. has a pretty good variety of things. They've got a pretty good variety of things. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, there's, and Paul's a good guy, and he knows his agronomy, and yeah, um, anyway. So, um, and the last thing I would say is that I generally recommend taking a soil test around the fall equinox, um, end of September or so. Um, if you think about the fall equinox, if you just can stick it in your head, um, that's a good time of year to take a soil test because that's pretty much the end of the growing season, roughly the end of the growing season. Um, and I like to say that the end of one growing season is the beginning of the next growing season because I envision it as a cyclical process. So. Um, you know, at that point in the year, your soil is about as tired and worn as it's going to be. Um, so get a, get a baseline on it then about what it looks like when it's you know tired, and do your math. Get your hands on what you need and get it applied. And you've got basically all of October 